So I want to answer the question tonight. I want us to think about why did Jesus come? The Bible tells us that Jesus came to die. Jesus said himself in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A few days before he was crucified, Jesus said to his disciples, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, take me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus said on the night before he was crucified the following morning in John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life, for his friends. The Bible tells us that Jesus came for one reason, he came to die. Now who did he come to die for? The Bible says that Jesus actually came to die for his enemies. He came to die for the ungodly. By definition, an ungodly person is someone whose mind does not think about God. They are not aware, nor do they respect His holiness in their life. They do whatever they want to do. They follow their own passions and desires. They don't worship God. They don't think about Him. They are ungodly. The Bible says that Jesus came to die. The Bible says at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, not the godly. The scripture says that God showed His love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to die, and he came to die for his enemies. Now the Bible tells us beyond that, as they think about further, why did Jesus come to die, or why did he come? He came to die, and he came to die for sinners. The Bible says that he came to die for sinners for a particular reason. He came to satisfy God's wrath for their ungodliness. That's why he came. You know, the Bible says that one of the characteristics of ungodly people is that they do not take serious how their sin, how God feels about it. The Bible says, for example, in the Old Testament, God is angry with the wicked every day. It's not that, and we live in a world where we see all kinds of wickedness, right? You, by the way, this is one of the reasons why some people say, I don't believe there is a God, because I see the evil that's in the world, and if there is a God, why would he let it happen? Why does God let things happen to people like this? The Bible actually says the fact that their evil exists in the world is not proof that God does not exist. The Bible says that God actually is angry with the wicked every day. The Bible says transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. He has no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. He flatters himself. What is flattery? When you lie to yourself. He flatters himself that God does not know what he's up to and that God doesn't care. That's what he flatters himself. The Bible says about a wicked person, the words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. That's the characteristic of an ungodly person, a wicked person. In their heart, they are bent on doing evil. They plot it, they don't reject it, and they don't think God cares about it. Now the Bible says it's for those kinds of people that Jesus came to die for. By the way, the scripture tells us at the end of the New Testament that the Lord will come with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The scripture is very clear that one day you will see how God feels about wickedness. One day Jesus is going to come. Now the Bible says he came the first time to die for people who are ungodly. That's why he came. 
He came to take away God's wrath towards their sin. The Bible says, I delivered you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, as the scripture said he would. The Bible says he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big New Testament word. Where does the word propitiation? It is the word that means this, to pacify the wrath. Someone feels great anger, and you do something that makes their anger appeased. The Bible says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The Bible says, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So what was Jesus doing on Good Friday from now about nine hours ago when he was crucified? About ten hours now. He was taking God's wrath for the sins of ungodly people. And Jesus did not wait to do this until I loved him. This is love, not that I love God, but that he loved me and sent his son to be the propitiation for my sins. So ladies and gentlemen, i got to first understand, before Jesus means anything to me, I have to understand what my sin means to God. The Bible says very clearly the second to the last book of the should be the last book of the Bible, second to the last chapter. But for the cowardly and the faithless and the detestable, for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, all liars, they will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. The scripture is very clear. You know, it's interesting, I was reading today about a very well-known guy in the Little Italy section here in the city. I, I know him because of our business. And he died suddenly about a month ago. And I was reading a local newspaper today, and they were talking about, and everyone is just sure that he's in heaven. And we all want to feel that way. We all are sentimental when someone that you care for passes away. But it doesn't matter what I feel or what I wish to be. God has already revealed himself very clearly. And the scripture says that God will pour out his wrath on sin. One day, every ungodly person, everything they have said against him in an ungodly way, when they have cursed him out and shaken their fists at him, God's going to bring him to wrath. Everything they've ever done in an ungodly way, God has not forgotten. And the scripture says one day at the final judgment, every single person will be resurrected out of the grave and they will give account to their maker. The scripture says on that day, God will open the books and he will judge everyone according to his deeds, except those whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. They will not be at that judgment. Because why? On Good Friday, 2,000 years ago, Jesus took God's wrath for their sin. That's why Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die for sinners to do two particular things. Number one, to pacify God's wrath against their ungodliness. Number two, the New Testament tells us that he also came to completely remove their guilt. Now, to understand this a little bit, to understand, you have to understand about the Jewish celebration. You guys have all heard of it called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In the Jewish celebration of, of Yom Kippur, which, by the way, you can read the full details, how it was celebrated in Leviticus chapter 16. What happens on Yom Kippur throughout Judaism when it first began? All the nation of Israel would gather one day outside of the tabernacle, and on that one day, only that day only, the high priest would go into the very center of that tabernacle, into a section that was closed off, closed off by a thick veil. It was called the Holy of the Holies, and inside the Holy of the Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box overlaid with gold, and inside the box were the Ten Commandments, God's law. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, they would take a lamb, or a bull, 
completely spotless and sacrifice it on the out, on the outer grounds of the tabernacle, the priest would walk into the Holy of Holies with the blood of this sacrificial lamb still in his hands. He would go into where the Ark of the Covenant was, and he would sprinkle the blood of that substitute animal on the lid of that box. By the word, the, the by the way, the word atonement means to cover. This is the day of covering. So by the blood of this lamb, he is covering God's moral law symbolically on behalf of all the people. So that lamb, that lamb's blood, God accepted as an atonement for their sin. That lamb dying propitiated God's wrath against the Jewish people in the past year. Here's what they would do next. The priest would walk out of the tabernacle, and on inside the tabernacle grounds was a living goat. And literally, when you read Leviticus 16, they call him the scapegoat. And the priest would take the remaining blood that was still in his hands, and he would place his hands on the horns of that goat and symbolically transfer the guilt of the Jewish people onto this living goat. You know what they do with that goat? They would take it out of the wilderness and never be seen again. So here's what happens on the atonement. God's wrath is propitiated and your guilt is removed, never to be seen again. That's called expiation, when this is removed. That is why Jesus came. Jesus came to die for sinners, to propitiate God's wrath, and to expiate their guilt. That's why Jesus came. Now, guys, I thought about this this past week. You know what the difference is between Christians and non-Christians? The difference is Christians want their sins to be dealt with. Whereas an ungodly person or person for whom Christ doesn't mean anything, really, they don't, they don't worry about it. Whereas a Christian, he knows in his heart that he has done wrong to God and wants that sin propitiated and expiated. By the way, when Jesus died on the cross, what were his final words? It is finished. He actually did on that morning, when he finally died by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he had completed the propitiation and he completed the, and completed the expiation. God's wrath was completely satisfied. God no longer feels anger. And secondly, all your guilt is gone. Now guys, I want to think about this real quick. There are 12 results of what Jesus did. Number one is expiation. Number one, your guilt is actually removed. The Bible says, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God, he takes away the sin of the world. That's expiation. He removes it. You know, one of the things people really struggle with in life is getting away from some of the things they've done in the past. It's hard to be cleansed in their conscience, they feel it. It's almost like they want to keep taking a shower. They can't get this stain off. Sometimes you'll hear that, people that will commit suicide. They can't run away from what they've done. They, they feel the shame of it. They can't, they don't, they're never expiated. And by the way, one of the wicked things about the ungodly world that we live in is some people will never let it be expiated. The great thing about Jesus, the one that you've actually offended the most, he actually does remove you of your guilt and never be seen. One of the things he did when he died on the cross was he granted you a complete and total forgiveness. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, God has forgiven us for our trespasses, having canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And he has disarmed rulers and authorities and put them to open shame having triumphed over them in him. 
One of the things the Bible describes, the word Satan itself means accuser. That's the devil's definition of the devil's name. It means accuser. What he loves to do is bait you into sin and then point and just let you know that you've done it. And the Bible says that one of the great things Jesus did when he died on the cross was God actually took the entire record of all your debts, everything where you disobeyed the legal demands, and God took the entire record of it out of the accuser's hands and nailed it to the cross. And the Bible says he disarmed them. So now the scripture says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justified you. Satan can't accuse you anymore because God totally disarmed that from him. He nailed it to the cross. Third thing Jesus did on Good Friday was he gave you freedom. The Bible says if the Son sets you free, you truly are free indeed. I had someone I spoke to this week. I knew that when I was a youth pastor, their life is in real big trouble right now. They told me they're really struggling with alcohol in particular. Throwing their life away. And what is it they need to know? They need to know that you're finally free, that you actually can escape from this. And Jesus said, when I set you free, you will truly be free. So on Good Friday, what's he doing? He is propitiating. He is expiating. He's removing the guilt. He is completely forgiving. He is giving you freedom. He is also healing you. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The word iniquity means guilty deeds. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every one of us has gone astray. And the deepest thing that lots of people need is a spiritual healing. There's deep, deep Disease in there that's got its fangs in them, that's got them by the throat. The Bible says that, by the way. His own iniquities will take the wicked himself, and he will be held by the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he will go astray. There comes a time when the sin that you, you thought you had or control has you by the neck. And you can't get free from it. And that's one thing Jesus does. He shatters doors of bronze and cuts in two bars of iron. And he actually heals you deep inside. The Bible says he himself in his own body took our sins on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. This is something that Jesus really wants you to know today. Your guilt has been removed. You are truly forgiven. You are truly free. You are truly healed. This is all the good news of the gospel. Also, the Bible tells us that what happened in the cross was that God was actually giving you hope. Scripture says, through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ himself loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. The Bible tells us that Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island, took this and put this on the state flag. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6, we have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. I've been thinking the last couple of days, can you guys imagine what would this world be like if there were no Jesus? If there was no possibility that deep in your heart you could know the sense of expiation, that your guilt was removed, that you truly were forgiven, that you truly were free, that you can be healed, that you do have hope. You know, one of the big differences between people that really trust the gospel and don't, 
one of the biggest ones is hope. And by the way, when the New Testament talks about hope, it's not talking about a really, 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 like we say, I hope it's going to happen. It's talking about a confident expectation. One of the big things, one of the practical impacts of that in the Christian's life is they don't fear death. They're able to be free, they're able to be excited, to be optimistic, to enjoy their lives and not be worried about them. One of the things the scripture says is that the devil does, he keeps people in lifelong slavery through their fear of death. It's not because I have a wishful hope, you know, I really hope this will happen. Like, again, everyone tells herself that their loved one dies, oh, they're all in a better place. I can't say that. God says he's going to deal with people according to the truth. What I can say is anyone who believes the gospel, anyone who has received Christ, they do have hope. Sixthly, the Bible tells us that in that day, a Good Friday, not only was Jesus giving us expiation and forgiveness and freedom and healing and hope, he was also giving us righteousness. The Bible calls it the word justification. That is when God makes you righteous. Before you're an ungodly person, but Christ has come to die for your sins, to take away God's wrath and remove your guilt. And when he does that, one of the things that happens is he justifies you. The Bible says all of us have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we are made righteous by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation in his blood to be received by faith. God makes you righteous. That's one of the things that he was doing. The Bible says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. I will exult in God my Savior, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. The Bible says about the Messiah, my servant shall make many to be counted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. When God makes a person righteous, it's something that he does judicially. He pronounces them, this is your status. I know what you were in your life, but this is what Jesus has done. He has satisfied my wrath and removed your guilt. And because of that, I now declare you righteous. Good Friday, we receive everyone who believes, who really cast his faith on Jesus, expiation, forgiveness, freedom, healing, hope, righteousness. We also receive life. Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 4, It is the will of my Father that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. One of the things that happened on Good Friday for everyone who trusts Jesus this night, once God's wrath for their ungodliness was pacified and once their guilt was removed, one of the things they received is life. The Bible calls it eternal. The eighth thing that happened is we all received light. The Bible says that people that lived in darkness have seen a great light. The people who dwelled in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12 to his disciples, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not remain in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 46, I have come as light in the world that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. It's like finally the light comes on in a person's life. They can see life the way it really is meant to be lived. And understand what is right and wrong, what is true and what is false. Light comes into their life. And by the way, you can see that light in them. The Bible says those who look to him are radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. The path of the righteous, the scripture says, is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until full day. You watch that person's life, there is a light to it. In fact, the Bible says about John the Baptist, he was a burning and a shining. 
when Jesus pacified God's wrath for the ungodly and expiated their guilt, God gave them on that day forgiveness, freedom, healing, hope, righteousness, life, light. He also gave them peace. The Bible says that God says to human beings, because of what Jesus did on Good Friday, peace, peace to those who are far, peace to those who are near, says the Lord. The Bible says, therefore, since we have been justified, made righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that, that means you and I are reconciled. I now reconciled. The God who I offended, the God whose wrath was against me, is now gone. Now God and I are brought into a relationship together. The New Testament tells us that, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. We urge you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is one of the awesome things that true Christians have that really believe what Jesus did. They have a real sense between they and God that there is peace there. The Bible says that in the New Testament, that in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. What was Jesus doing on Good Friday? He was also giving people reconciliation, propitiation, expiation, justification, reconciliation, healing and freedom and forgiveness and life and light and hope. And he was also giving them redemption. Your life is redeemed. The Bible says, because of the Messiah that God says to human beings, a redeemer will come to those who turn from their transgression, says the Lord. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, he has sent forth the spirit of his son into our heart, by which we cry, Abba, Father. I now see God as someone who loves me and that I know. That's one of the things that Jesus was doing on that day. And the Bible says that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, according to Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 15. So that all who have been called may receive the promised inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from all their transgressions committed under the first covenant, Hebrews 9.15. Not only this, ladies and gentlemen, but on that day, on Good Friday, was he giving us expiation, forgiveness, and freedom, and healing, and hope, and justification, and life, and light, and peace, and redemption. He was also giving us salvation. The Bible says, when Jesus, before he was ever born, the angel told his father, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The scripture says, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Guys, can you imagine if we lived in a world where there were no Jesus? There would be no expiation. There would be no forgiveness. There would be no freedom. There would be no healing. There would be no hope. There would be no justification. There would be no life. There would be no light. There would be no reconciliation. There would be no redemption. There would be no salvation. And in fact, there would be no God. The Bible tells us that that's the last thing Jesus was doing on the cross. Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. The greatest gift that God gave you on Good Friday is himself. He gave you all those other things, 
plus him. I want you to look at this passage that I asked you to turn. I want to read these verses. Isaiah 61. Notice what the scripture says about the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, who is this good news? If you feel poor, if you feel brokenhearted, if you feel like you're a captive, if you feel like you're in a prison of sorts, you're the person that Jesus came for. It's that person that Good Friday means everything to them because that's who he came for. He came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, that God favors you. And the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That's what Jesus came to do on Good Friday, to set free captives, to open the eyes of the blind, to grant you God's favor. That's what he came to do. Why did Jesus come? He came to die. He came to die for his enemies, to do two things, to satisfy God's wrath against their rebellion and to completely remove their guilt. And when he did, he also gave them forgiveness and freedom and healing and hope and righteousness and life and peace and light and redemption and salvation, and he gave them himself. So what should you do? The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 29, this is the work of God, to believe in him he has sent. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you simply to turn from your transgressions and to say, God, I believe, here in 2021, on April the 2nd tonight, I believe that Jesus, when he was dying 2,000 years ago, was propitiating my sin. And I receive that with great thanksgiving. The Bible says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Because I have to tell you personally, as a person who is convinced that Jesus really did die, and he did it for the reasons the Bible says, I cannot tell you what it means to me to know this freedom, to know this forgiveness, to know this healing, to know this hope, to know this light, to know this light, to know this peace, to experience this salvation, to know this redemption, and God himself. That's what God wants to give you, Jesus. I want you to notice before we close, in the front of our program tonight, we have this passage. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It was God's will to put his son to death so that your sins could be propitiated, your guilt expiated, and with that, everything else. Freedom, forgiveness, healing, hope, and righteousness in God's own. I hope that tonight, if you're a person who has believed the gospel, that you will be encouraged about that. And if you have not yet, you will offer, you will receive the offer that God has given you tonight. The Bible says, as many as receive him, to them he gives the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. The word belief in the Bible means to be persuaded. If you reject Jesus Christ, the Bible says God's wrath abides on you. You will, you will face his wrath. Either Christ took it for you, or you will take it. That's the clear message of the Now we're going to close tonight with one song. It's not in the program, but we'll have it on the wall here called Jesus Messiah. I want to sing this song together. And by the way, I just want to say to everyone, 
if any of you, when we get done here, if you have questions about what we talked about or would like to know more, I'd love to certainly speak with you to understand it more. What I've explained to you is the gospel, the good news. And may the Lord help us to enjoy it and understand it more and more. I want to sing this song together, Jesus Messiah, and then we'll close with a word of prayer. actually the thing that God uses to redeem human beings. He uses the preaching of the gospel. That's what he uses. You know, the Bible says that Jewish people demand signs. They want to see some miracle. People often say that, well, if God really existed, why does he like write his name in the sky? And of course, God said, I'm going to give you one sign. It's wicked that you keep demanding signs. You know what you notice about the Jewish people? There were never enough signs. I'm going to give you one. He said it'll be the sign of Jonah. We'll talk about that on Sunday, the resurrection. That's the one sign he said he would give. 
He said the Greek people, the non-Jewish people, they don't want signs. They want wisdom. They want you to tell them some very intellectual argument that will be very persuasive. Then they'll believe. The Bible says the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. God is simply calling you to believe the gospel. It's that simple. Will you do it? The entire world is dated by his existence. Jesus is not a fictitious figure. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that he was crucified is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. The most famous person who ever lived. Why does no one, why is it in the story of the Bible we see no one after three days laying a flower in Jesus' grave? And people go to Elvis' grave by the thousands every year. They, they still make pilgrimages to Muhammad's grave. Every famous guru in the world will go and pay their respects. Jesus is the most pivotal person in human history. Why does no one go and lay a flower in his grave? It's not there. So what are you going to do with that? There comes a point in your life you have to say, you know what? Quit telling yourself what you want to tell yourself. Listen to the gospel. You guys ever been to a party or you see someone that gives someone a present? And when they open up a box, it's another box inside. They open up the next box, it's another box inside. That's the way it is with the gospel. When God gives you Jesus... With him is also freedom, healing, forgiveness, and life, and life, and the gift just keeps on coming. That's why the New Testament prays for Christians that you might know the riches of his inheritance. That is. And that's what the, ultimately the whole Bible is about, is explaining to you everything that God has given me in Jesus. That's why I really encourage everyone, you know, if you're here locally, you ought to come to the immersed Bible experience over the next day. Really I think it would be really helpful. I know. I know it is for me. I want to thank you guys all for coming out tonight and Friday is for the special day to really understand what Jesus did. I hope you all will come back on Sunday because crucifixion and the resurrection are the bookends of the gospel. The resurrection tells us something else, which we'll talk about on Sunday. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done for ungodly people. Lord, all of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory, and all of us have been justified by your grace as a gift. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Lord, and this is to be received by faith. Lord, I pray that you'll take your word that's preached tonight, and for those who have not had faith before this evening, and you will give them this gift, Lord, that they would believe and be persuaded. So much so that they would commit their life to following you like all your disciples do. Lord, I pray for those who have believed in you, you would strengthen their faith as a result of us thinking about what you've done for us tonight. Lord, help us to love and enjoy and trust you more. We pray that you would make our lives so full of the freedom you've given us and the healing and the hope and the life and the light and the peace and the redemption that we would be an undeniable evidence to everyone who knows us that you do live and you do save. We pray all these things in your name.